What's interesting about locust is that this transition from a shy grasshopper to a swarming locust is dramatic. It's anatomical, it's behavioral, it's physiological, it's nutritional, and it's a big change in the animal that happens somewhat rapidly. Trying to understand that requires that you look at all of these coordinating phenomena together. And so you have to have expertise in different aspects of the biology of the animal and technology to be able to come to a good answer. Of course, one person cannot know everything, but if we bring in people with different expertise at different scales within biological organization, we can actually bring these brain powers together to understand something greater that no single lab or no single scientist can understand. At Behavioral Plastics Research Institute, we are trying to do that. This NSF grant is allowing us to move tools into the locust system that have never been in the locust system before. I'm really interested in understanding how bacteria influence their host, and specifically I study insect gut bacteria. And because locusts do so many interesting ecological and evolutionary things, I'm interested in how microbes have a role to play there. So my area of expertise is nutritional physiology and ecology. In collaboration with my students, in particular Chris Brennan, is understanding how nutritional inputs influence gene expression. When it comes to feeding and, and how they regulate their nutritional inputs, one of the critical resources that the BPR has developed that hadn't existed previously were high quality genomes. The genome is the foundation right now to study any organism. The first thing that happened with BPRI is to put the genomes together and then to help annotate them, and it's now exciting to see how these annotations are being used. The experiments that are done across the Institute are mapped and interpreted with the help of these genomes. Eris Lieberman Aiden is one of the lead uh, people sort of in the field of 3D genome sequencing. He's one of the inventors of this technology called HiC. Originally it was put forward to figure out how the human genome folds in 3D. It helps assemble the genomes cheaply, which comes in handy if you need to put together a lot of genomes from different locusts and grasshoppers. A key application of 3D genomics is its use in the so-called problem of assembling genomes. This is what the Human Genome Project did. It took decades, it cost about $4 billion to do 3D genomics methods, actually bring down the cost very, very, very considerably and make it possible to greatly improve the quality of the results. In order to be able to analyze a gene of interest or a gene involved in a process of interest and manipulate it to see if it has an effect, you need to be able to manipulate the genome. And so that's where we are trying to transfer the methodologies that work really well in Sophil Melanogaster into the locust species. In order to really specifically affect a gene of interest, you need more precise methods. And that's where CRISPR came in. We just used Cas9 protein which is what cuts the DNA in the presence of a guide that guides it to that particular spot where it should cut. And we in vitro transcribed the guide and we brought the protein with the guide together and then injected that with a repair template to bring something into genome so that we can recognize that we actually made a genome edit. And so that method works at low frequency in other fly species that we tried first before we jumped to locust. And so we're tinkering with these elements, trying to clone them out and bring them into our plasmid sequences to then bring into eggs. My lab has been working on collision avoidance for more than 20 years. We're interested in how animals perceive objects that are approaching on a collision course and how they generate escape behaviors in response to those. My background is in mathematical physics. 
I'm interested also in modeling biological system using uh, mathematical tools. So I do a lot of that also at the level of single cells and how they communicate with each other. One of the reasons why locusts are very interesting for collision avoidance behaviors is that you have the system where we understand the pathway the best. You have actually one single neuron on each side of the brain, one for each eye, that actually is able to respond very selectively to objects that are approaching on the collision course, much less to, let's say, an object that's translating or missing the animal or, or some, some other visual stimulus. What we can do is engineer electrodes to implant in the brain and then record from the brain. It's kind of like a little microphone and we're listening in on the conversations of different parts of the brain talking to each other. And we can do that while we're presenting olfactory stimuli, so like smells. By doing this, we're hoping to better understand the language by which uh, different neurons talk to each other with. On a genetic level, in order to enact a lot of changes in the brain. There has to be genetic, transcriptomic, epigenetic changes that we haven't even started to investigate. So once you know what are the genes and you can kind of study them, you want to know how they're expressed in cells. There's a team of people that was doing what we call transcriptomic, which is looking at how genes are expressed either across different phases or within different cell types within the, the animals and also across the different phases. Locus is a very interesting system because of the plasticity. But how to understand it at a single cell level, it is totally unknown. It's triggered by one single cell or triggered by a set of single cells, for instance in the brain or in the other part of the bodies. So those are the kind of things we want to really decipher. In the lab, what we do is really isolate the single cells, for instance, single neurons from the grasshopper and put it into nanoliter droplet and profile them at a large scale. So we provide those important descriptions for other biologists in the BPI to study. So we kind of like mapping out the terrain of the, of the earth and then other people will look for the interesting mountains to show this is what matters. You can take the idea from the genetics and try to test it with behavior, test it with physiology. Vivian Peralta Santana, a PhD student in my lab, and she's also a National Science Foundation graduate research fellow. She's interested in understanding the transgenerational phenotypic plasticity. What mother experiences actually may have an important implication for the babies. We know all that, but there's really not good model system to study. Turns out that locusts are a great model system for studying that. Dr. Maeva Pesher, uh, she's a postdoc at BPRI, and she is working on many things, but her primary focus is to understand the gene expression differences during the change from solitarius to gregarious transition. So here we have a beautiful marked female and I'm going to dissect it immediately to obtain tissue for RNA. So we certainly hope that we can capitalize on all the tools and all the information that we've gathered in the past four and a half years to understand much better and in much more detail phase change across different perspectives in the next five years if we are able to continue working uh, on this as a coherent group, which is what, what we hope. Any really modern scientific technology, it's the result of human collective action. And that is really true at all levels, right? That's true at the level of scientific collaboration. It's also true at the level of societies that decide to invest in making it possible for people to live stable lives, doing research, who invest in things like the National Science Foundation, and say, hey, this is gonna be a part of life in our society. And that choice, I think, makes us all active participants in the scientific destiny of this country and this species.